So thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate your interest in this uh, complicated and difficult uh, topic of U.S. interventionism in, in Syria. Um, our panelists, uh, Mark Crispin Miller just stepped out, he'll be right back, uh, have a remarkable range of uh, experience and investigative insights and will provide some critical perspective that is not often heard unless you know where to look. Um, that was one of, of the main motivations for this panel, is to bring information to the public, um, especially to the socially conscious public, such as you might find at the Left Forum, uh, information that is not well known to most people. And we, were, we will talk about what that is. Um, we know that the topic of Syria can be a controversial, sometimes polarizing topic in the left, uh, just as other topics are, um, and that there are many strong feelings about this exceedingly violent and painful situation. Um, so we're not here to convince anyone that they're mistaken or believe the wrong things. We're here to simply provide a critical historical and political context and analysis that has deliberately been omitted from the U.S. mainstream media, um, which we feel that as American taxpayers, uh, you, you, you deserve this knowledge uh, when it comes to the coverage of Syria. Um, and if you understand the U.S. corporate control media, then you understand that the CIA and State Department have a great deal of influence on the talking points that are repeated um, and become the truth. Uh, or accepted narratives. Um, so today we hope to fill that gap. Of course, I don't ex expect everyone to agree with everything, but we we'll, uh, do hope that you will consider with an open mind uh, the information that we will provide uh, on a very dangerous situation, perhaps the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. Um, as we really do want to see an end to the suffering of the Syrian people and limit US destructive US inter interventionism. Uh, Oh, sorry, okay. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the refugee crisis, and while we cannot even begin to convey the depth of suffering and anguish and hardship that the Syrian people are going through, I think we want to explore the ways in which we can confront the driving factors of terrorism and militarism to bring about a, a more peaceful future for the Syrian people. Um, so we want to uh, dive into uh, w what a better understanding of, of the U.S. pursuit of regime change uh, it, it involves and what this means uh, for our, our current crisis. So I'd like to... Oh, is Mark back? <laughs> he's MIA. Um, I think he's supposed to go first. But uh, So our panelists here today are a, a professor of media studies at NYU, uh, Mark Crispin Miller, who will be here shortly, I hope. <laughs> He's always been dedicated to exposing mainstream media uh, manipulation and sometimes deception. And uh, the hard-hitting investigative journalist Jason Hertler, uh, author of The Sins of Empire and Unmasking U.S. Imperialism, uh, which is also very much the goal of this panel. And we're also very honored to have the expertise of former CIA officer Philip Garaldi, who has served 19 years overseas and whose background in counterterrorism uh, and military intelligence and global security are invaluable to understanding recent events in Syria. Um, Phil is also the executive director of the Council for the National Interest, a Washington-based advocacy group, and his recent essays include Who is Destroying Syria, which is an extremely helpful and informative uh, essay and a, a question that we will try to answer today. Uh, so thank you all for your attendance and attention. We will have a question and answer period at the end uh, where your comments and questions and concerns can be addressed. Uh, until then, I respectfully ask everyone to allow our speakers to present their information uh, without interruption and we can look forward to the discussion afterward. Uh, Mark, I already introduced you, so you they all know how great you are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's all true. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, even, even though we're focusing on Syria today uh, at the present moment, that is 2017, I, I thought it would be appropriate to begin by harking back to 1917, a hundred years ago, uh, to take note of the uh, catastrophic success 
of the Allied propaganda drive that brought the United States into World War I, which was actually a very uh, direct echo of the British propaganda drive from two years earlier that uh, impelled the British people to support uh, joining the drive to defeat the Hun and save poor little Belgium from its ongoing rape by that uh, brutal entity. Uh, the British and then the Americans were uh, bowled over by these reports of the Germans uh, impaling babies on bayonets, cutting the breasts off of Red Cross nurses. Uh, there was the story of the crucified Canadian, a Canadian soldier who'd actually been crucified by the, by the Germans. This was uh, the first time that a state had ever used the resources of mass suasion, of propaganda, to get an entire population to support uh, a war that they ordinarily wouldn't have supported ever uh, because the cause was an obscure one. It was really just a kind of imperial scramble. Different imperial powers were fighting with each other over Africa and places like that. But it was represented as a fight to um, make the world safe for democracy, to save civilization itself from the brutal Germans. And as I say, it can't be stressed strongly enough or repeatedly enough that it was a rousing success. During the war, a few journalists, a few American journalists actually made an effort to go over to Europe and follow the German army around and report on what they were actually doing. And they found, it's important to note, they found the German army was indeed uh, brutal. They functioned with brutal efficiency. So they didn't go over there and find that they were a bunch of hippies mm -hmm. handing out flowers, but they also found no evidence whatsoever to support any of those particular atrocity claims that were used so effectively. All right, so three journalists were basically spitting into the wind reported to their respective papers that this was all wildly exaggerated. It didn't make any difference. It wasn't until 10 years later when uh, a member of parliament named Arthur Ponsonby wrote a book called Lies in Wartime in which he carefully, meticulously cataloged each of these notorious claims and found that they had all been made up. And he explained how it had been done. He explained what the purpose of each propaganda drive was. And this had a huge effect on public opinion, both in Britain and in the United States. And people realized briefly that propaganda uh, was um, actually an extremely effective and very dangerous force. All right, now I want to jump ahead. Arthur Ponsonby, P-O-N-S-O-N-B-Y. Now this is... Um, I'm going to jump ahead very briefly before I get to today uh, to a kind of midpoint moment. Uh, this is when some of the most avid students of the British propaganda, that is uh, Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler, had, and I'm not being facetious, uh, Hitler says in Mein Kampf that he learned a great deal from the British propaganda in World War I. Uh, they were about, the Nazis were about to attack Poland, okay? William Shirer of CBS News was over in Berlin. He was stationed there as a CBS newsman, and he kept a diary, the Berlin Diary, which he ended up having to smuggle out of Germany and had published a huge bestseller. And I want to read you uh, his entry for August 10th, 1939. How completely isolated a world the German people live in. A glance at the newspapers yesterday and today reminds you of it. Whereas all the rest of the world considers that the peace is about to be broken by Germany, that it is Germany that is threatening to attack Poland over Danzig, here in Germany, in the world the local newspapers create, the very reverse is being maintained. Not that it surprises me, but when you are away for a while, you forget. You've gone away and he came back. What the Nazi papers are proclaiming is this, that it is Poland which is disturbing the peace of Europe, Poland which is threatening Germany with armed invasion, and so forth. 
This is the Germany of last September when the steam was turned on Czechoslovakia. And if you go back and look at his entry for the year before, he's seen the same thing before the German uh, invasion of, uh, or seizure of Czechoslovakia. Now he quotes some headlines. Poland, look out, warns the Berliner Zeitung headline, adding, answer to Poland, the runner amok against peace and right in Europe. Or the headline in Der Führer, daily paper of Karlsruhe, which I bought on the train. Warsaw threatens bombardment of Danzig. Unbelievable agitation of the Polish arch madness. This is what he says. For perverse perversion of the truth, this is good. You ask, but the German people can't possibly believe these lies. Then you talk to them. So many do. Okay, I think there's a lesson in this for us uh, living here today to illustrate the uh, relevance of that harrowing anecdote uh, of, of life under Dr. Goebbels's press regime. I'm gonna read you uh, from a piece that came out in the New York Times on June 2nd, 2016, a top aide to Assad takes serious case to a US audience. This is a, not a front page piece but it was about a virtual appearance at the National Press Club in Washington by Butaina Shaban, a top advisor to President Bashar Assad of Syria, a country where the press is state controlled, and the Times makes much of this as it always has, a state controlled press, the state controlled press, the state controlled press. Now, um, it, you know, I, I assume that in, in uh, Damascus, where the press is state controlled, a high White House official could probably attend an anti-terrorism news conference, which is what this is, and talk to Syrian journalists uh, unmolested. But that wasn't the hearing that Dr. Shaban got at the National Press Club. Uh, quote, the Obama administration reacted with alarm to word of her nearby appearance via Skype with a State Department spokesman calling her a propaganda mouthpiece for Assad. Okay, so, so the piece sets up a kind of uh, a filter through which we read about the event and through which we understand this member of Assad's government. Now, uh, the piece points out that the event was tumultuous, her brief speech followed by an extraordinary and at times contentious one hour question and answer session with journalists and others, uh, at one point nearly devolving into chaos. You kill innocent people, a person who was not identified shouted as the room erupted in jeers and a moderator called for security. The person was not detained. So you can kind of picture the atmosphere here, right? Okay, now, the description of her, interesting. She bristled at questions about acts her government or close associates are suspected of committing, including the use of barrel bombs to kill civilians. I'm gonna read that sentence again. She bristled at questions about acts her government or close associates are suspected of committing, including the use of barrel bombs to kill civilians. Now, I don't have to list for you examples of similar atrocity campaigns that we've read about in the Western press. Aleppo, various chemical gas attacks, uh, the crematorium, did you read about this in the Times recently? The huge, uh, it's like, you know, Buchenwald or Auschwitz, right in the middle of Damascus, burning up the bodies of all these Syrians. There are many of them. And you would not know, this is the important point, you would not know from reading the New York Times or any of its uh, affiliates in, in the US press or from watching CNN or MSNBC or listening to NPR, you wouldn't know, for example, that the barrel bombs meme was meticulously demolished uh, by Robert Perry of Consortium News. As indeed- Wait, wait a minute, sir, are you denying- Hang on, it's just a minute. Wait, 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 are you denying that Assad's regime has dropped barrel bombs on its people? Just a minute. He's talking about a specific instance of barrel bombs. I'm, I'm talking about it. No, I, I will answer you. I will answer you. I really would like to know. Stop. I'm a professor at Fordham. Well, I have a question now. I'm not going to wait for that. I'm sorry, but it's something like this. 300,000 people have been murdered by that regime. Well, that's tremendous. Because that is true. Then ask for a question. 
as we have time, for our question and answer period. But it's so just one normal question. Question. Would you right. Would you no, 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 as far as 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 as
No, 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 no. Stop. Because listen to what I just said. This is war propaganda. This is war propaganda. What is the purpose of propaganda? Propaganda is not an intellectual exercise. Propaganda is a state instrument whose purpose is to bring about a particular policy. Okay? In this case, it's to bring about a policy of war. All right? Just as all the stories about the invasion of Ukraine and the seizure of Crimea, which I have no doubt you also believe, the purpose of that propaganda is to bring on war with Russia. This is war propaganda. It is war propaganda. So that, okay, when you sign on and simply repeat it, and, and repeat it with vehemence and with conviction and with certainty, without bothering to look into it, without being skeptical of the source, which in this case is the US government, okay, acting through the press, you are participating in a war propaganda drive. And I don't believe that you want to see us, maybe you do, uh, declare a no-fly zone in Syria, run the risk of shooting down Russian planes, and bringing us past the brink of a, of a nuclear exchange with a country that has a huge arsenal of nuclear weapons. That's what we're talking about here, that this is war propaganda, okay? Now, uh, you know, I, I, I think th this is not to say in any way that the Assad regime is benign or democratic, okay? Any, any, any more than to argue against the claim that Russia hacked the election is to say that Vladimir Putin is, is a peach, is your kindly uncle. That's not the point. I mean, we are not going to war with Saudi Arabia, which has an extremely uh, dangerous and violent government and violently represses its people. We're not going to war with Israel, whose human rights record is highly questionable. There's a lot of places with brutal governments we're not going to war with, okay? So the point to make here is that the way in which the US press, our free press, consistently uh, repeats exactly what it's told by the state and has those claims re-echoed endlessly across the spectrum of the press, okay? And then excludes, excludes uh, contrary evidence, excludes critiques of the official story. In doing that, okay, it actually creates a kind of unanimity or uniformity of opinion that's directly comparable to the way the Germans responded in Berlin, to the, everything they saw their newspapers say. I mean, not everybody has the time or the inclination to go around and read outside the boundaries of the official narrative. I mean, I'm a professor of media studies, so it's, a, it's my professional obligation to go and, and, and do this and teach my students how to do it, too. Don't simply believe what you read and hear just because the state said that it's true. And all these reports about Syria fall into that category. Yeah, let's not get uh, run down the same road we, we were run down in 2002-2003. Well, it's the same plan. That, that's actually, well, he's making a very good point, and then I'm going to, I should stop after this. I had, I had much else to say, but I, I again, I'm, Professor, I'm grateful for the, for the interruption, and I, I hope the audience is grateful for it, too, because it was a productive interruption. You know, Hitler said that the receptivity of the masses is limited and their intelligence is small, but their power of forgetting is enormous, okay? I don't often quote the, the Fuhrer, you know, it's not my favorite <laughs> author, but he knew what he was talking about. The people's power of forgetting is enormous. Now, we can't expect people to remember what happened in World War I. I mean, that to us is a comic memory from long ago and everybody moved real fast, you know. Uh, we can't expect people even to remember the Gulf of Tonkin re resolution that led to a, a, an enormous expansion of the war in Vietnam, and it was a, based on a lie, okay, that, that North Vietnamese gunboats had attacked American military forces. That was a lie. We can't expect people to remember something decades ago. We could, however, expect people, thinking people at least, to remember what happened in 2003 when we were told about the weapons of mass destruction. And when, let me add, there was the biggest anti-war march in human history all over the planet. Unprecedented numbers of people turned out and marched against that war. But maybe, if, you know, if we can't expect people to remember something that happened in 2003, we can expect them to remember something that happened in 2013 
when we were suddenly told that there was a sarin gas attack on the Syrian people by Assad's government, uh, Barack Obama hesitated to invade as he had promised he would if Assad crossed that red line. And what happened? Seymour Hersh revealed that that gas had been used by the rebels who had gotten it from the government of Turkey. Not a single US outlet would take that story by our most eminent investigative journalist. He had to publish it in the London Review of Books. Okay? About eight months later, that story was confirmed in every detail by the leading daily paper in Turkey, Zaman. Their investigative team looked into it, and they said, it's true, Hirsch is right. Assad's government did not commit that atrocity. It was the rebels. It was what we call a false flag. Okay? Can we not remember that? That's not that long ago. But sure enough, the gas attack, or whatever it was, in Idlib recently, right, just a few months ago, people start screaming about it. This is just like 2013. You know, even the journalists in the Times are saying this is just like 2013. Even though the Times itself had dropped the claim. They had a list of Assad's atrocities with the Idlib coverage, and the 2013 attack was missing from the list. So they had kind of retreated from that because it was a little bit embarrassing to them that Hirsch had shown it was bogus. Nevertheless, for propaganda purposes, it still served, okay? And the tragic thing about this, aside from the indescribable tragedy for the Syrian people, is that this time there is no huge outpouring of anti-war protest, okay? This is on the left. The left has bought into this. The White Helmets, you, you know, the White Helmets is, is a propaganda masterpiece that cost about a hundred million dollars. <laughs> it has been it has been meticulously demolished by several journalists, including Vanessa Beely, who's written, I think, a dozen pieces on it. John Pilger uh, recently did a terrific interview about the White Helmets. The White Helmets is a jihadist enterprise, okay? These people are extremely dangerous, and they're posing as, uh, uh, you know, good citizens in Syria, saving the masses from Assad's brutal uh, uh, mistreatment, okay? Well, it's bad enough that the White Helmets get mainstream coverage, but they also get admiring discussion on democracy now. The documentary is on Netflix, and it got an Academy Award. This documentary got an Academy Award, and it is, it is a fake from start to finish, okay? So what we're talking about now is, is really kind of an advance on what we saw in Berlin in 1939, because now much of the left, much of the liberal media, Hollywood, Okay, all these decidedly non-Nazi entities are simply jumping in, helping with the war propaganda when they should be exposing it and helping all the rest of us to resist it. Thank you. We were actually supposed to introduce the panel with some opening remarks from radio host of INN World Report, Tom Kiley, but he was a few minutes late. So before I introduce our next uh, panelist, I'm just going to allow uh, Tom to make a few, few opening remarks about why you feel okay uh, that this panel is Without important. further ado, I'm yes. sorry, Priya. Yes. I'm well, you've dedicated your life to alternative media, and, and Thank so you. if you just want to... I'm sorry, folks, it took me a while to find this room. I went all the way around, and it kept saying, go to the other side, you know. Make your own panel if you can. Yeah. Okay. Hurry up and melt, snowflake. Okay. Um, let, let me, uh, my name is Tom Kiley. And uh, I know Priya Reddy for some time now. We worked together and started to create alternative media with the big fake news story that uh, George Bush had won the 2000 election, okay? Uh, now it's a popular term. Back then we worked to pioneer it, okay? And I've worked since 2000, since 2001, I should say, uh, to do that. And I've had Mr. Giraldi. I also uh, met with Mark Miller during those times when there was a vibrant... Uh, pro-voting movement that was killed as a result of 
okay, as well as an anti-war movement and so forth. And I just wanted to say that uh, Professor Miller is absolutely right. The press has played a vital role, and shame on the left. Shame, I, don't, I can't even call my left the left anymore. I call it the pro-war left, okay? Because they're eating this stuff up hook, line, and sinker, all right? And it's, it's, it's an absolute disgrace. There are true leftists left, but they're being banned even in this forum, okay, where you can't even uh, go and see them, okay? There are true leftists, and, and their careers are in danger as well, all right? There's just so many, many lives. Uh, Professor Miller uh, mentioned uh, Robert Parry, who was one of my great inspirations. When you know the term Iran-Contra, okay, you know the, Iran, uh, the Contra part because Robert Parry broke that story, okay? And this philosophy guy wants to poo-poo that person's reporting about barrel bombs in Syria? Mr. Philosophy over here, who couldn't even stand. Listen, this is the problem with the left. They're I, I can't make sense anymore of right and left anymore. Now, what I can make sense of, does this person believe in the mainstream media as if it was gospel or do they not? Try it, all of you. Try that and see if your world starts to make much more sense now, okay? Because there is a plethora of examples of what, for all his faults, Donald Trump has now put into the lexicon fake news. I call it real fake news. That meme blew up in the face of the corporate media, okay? They tried to put the alternative media down with this pejorative that they generated fake news and all of their fake news is now a matter of discussion. So I call them the real fake news, okay? <laughs> the New York Times and those people. And what do we have? Uh, that They counted the votes in Florida and found out that Al Gore won. What did they do about it? They buried it in the back pages in November of 2001 after 9-11, okay? What a huge fake news story that George Bush won the election in 2000. Nonsense. You wanna go, you, you need more, you need more? How about this big one? Uh, remember the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? What a fake news story. How many of these laughing, chortling, talking heads across the spectrum, on the right, on the left, ha <laughs> Donald Rumsfeld, not only do they have them, we know right where they are. Well, there's a, a, a Islamophobia, what, a million dead, innocent Muslims from Iraq because of that lie? Did anybody ever apologize about that in the mainstream media that this philosophy professor seems to think the BBC, the BBC, that's the British Broadcasting System. Last time I checked, that was in support of the British Empire. <laughs> Are they going to run a story that's going to damage the British Empire? No. But to get you to think that they're so cool, they're going to run a lot of cool stories. They're going to run edgy stories, you know, to get cred, okay? They, they're not going to run anything against the British Empire. You might as well call the New York Times the BBC of uh, the United States, okay? <laughs> That's a fact, and people are now waking up and they're scared and they're panicking. So the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, we started a group here in New York called INN World Report, International News Net World Report, and uh, after helping Amy Goodman get onto Free Speech TV, they gave us a shot, we had our own show, a national show on the Dish Network satellite system, okay? For the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. On our little show, and I wish, friends, I could tell you we had a zero budget, but we didn't. We had a negative budget. We dug in our pockets to get this news out, okay? On our show, before the invasion of Iraq, we told the United States of America that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, okay? There was not a pretext for invasion. How did we do it? We asked Scott Ritter, the guy who took all the weapons out, to come on our show and say it, okay? And he did. Could he get on to NBC, ABC, CIA, FOX, all the rest? No. He took our little know-nothing no show on national TV. That was a big fake news lie. With a all this Islamophobia, a million dead Iraqis, innocent, had nothing to do with 9-11 or anything. Where's the oops? Where's the I'm sorry? Where's the mea culpa? No, no, no. It's all par for the course. Pulled another one. And it's because you people are decent people. 
And you need to be frightened before you're going to go along with the murder of a million innocent Islamic people on the other side of the world. That's what this is about. And it's high time that the left start to realize, and it's not just the corporate media either, okay? Shows like Democracy Now! are so intent on preaching to the converted, okay? And I, Okay, on INN, we are transpartisan. We talk to people from both sides of the, of the spectrum. Call it what you will. Donald Trump, for all his faults and their legion, he's on stage saying the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was a lie, and your brother's administration knew it was a lie. Okay? Where was Mr. Pro Philosophy Professor then? Okay, you know what happened? Five days later, Jeb Bush dropped out of the race. And the, and the whole neocon apparatus went nuts. You can't say that. It was the truth. It was the truth. And it goes on and on. And the same thing is happening with Syria, okay? Uh, the same thing is happening with all these poor people who are, who, who, you, you want to fix the migrant crisis? Stop bombing their homes. That's the fix of the migrant crisis. This isn't a hurricane. No. And what the left was like, oh, we got to get everybody. Stop. Go back in the streets again. Oh, Barack Obama, no more anti-war movement. I used to make a joke before the election. What would be the difference between a Hillary Clinton presidency and a Jeb Bush presidency. With a Hillary Clinton presidency, uh, a Jeb Bush presidency, you're gonna get all the wars and you're gonna get the return of the anti-war movement. With a Hillary Clinton presidency, you're gonna get all the wars, period. All right, so let's get the left back on track, okay? And let's stop going to, to, to these things where they invite people who work for John Negroponte, you, you know, Amnesty International, they get the death squad people coming down. It's crazy. I'm sorry, it was a bit, bit of a rant, but I just wanted you to hear from the alternative media, you know, uh, which is really shaking their tree right now, and they're trying to censor us, even here at the Left Forum. Well, I really appreciate your uh, passion, your experience, your insights, Tom. Thank you. and. Um, Next up is investigative journalist and author Jason Herthler. Uh, very proud and happy that you can uh, join us today. Uh, so if you just want to um, dive right in, sure. that would be fantastic. <coughs> or Excellent. Sorry? Yeah, my name is Jason Herthler, H-I-R-T-H-L-E-R. -E I write regularly on Counterpunch and Dissident Voice and the Greenville Post and a variety of other uh, progressive left uh, sites. And I'm occasionally on uh, RT and, and uh, Press TV and, and those channels that are outside of the mainstream. So I wanted to just uh, suggest, uh, make a few points about what I think the kind of world that we live in in the states as I've experienced it and I think others have experienced it. Um, first I, I wanted to point out that I think as I think Noam Chomsky calls it we live inside this doctrinal system um, and this system is established by uh, I think what they call the Overton window which defines the spectrum of acceptable debate in any society uh, and what defines what acceptable opinion is in any society um, and I think in our in our society our corporatocracy our oligarchy I think what we have is uh, a spectrum of debate that allows us to talk in the mainstream media about anything that supports the corporate oligarchy um, that owns and runs uh, the state. And uh, to me, the corporate oligarchy includes the Wall Street banks, the defense industry, the energy industry, and that includes not just the oil and gas companies, but companies like Monsanto and Bear Crop Science, who I used to do some work for before I realized what was going on. Um, and then also the Pentagon and the intelligence ag agencies in the state and uh, the mainstream media, which I think is part of that, but they kind of act as a front organization for uh, the criminal oligarchy. So I think that the oligarchy, anything that supports what the oligarchy uh, wants is acceptable opinion within the spectrum of debate. The oligarchy that profits off of war and the expansion of the neoliberal world order. Um, if you think about how these uh, how the uh, 
the oligarchy profits off of war, well, the defense industry profits by selling the guns um, that take down uh, a regime uh, or a regime or a government uh, wherever uh, they want, whether it's Iraq or Syria or Libya. But they also sell guns into the new uh, regime that's propped up, if one is propped up. You know, in Libya, we, they still haven't propped up haven't stood up a government uh, in any real sense. Um, but then the banks profit by uh, funding through loans uh, and kind of enslaving these emerging economies that we uh, attack and overthrow, enslaving them with debt, and they make endless uh, compound interest off the loans that they give. We see that happening in Greece. Um, the, the defense industry, the energy industry comes in, obviously. We've shown all the big oil companies and gas companies establish themselves in Iraq now and they'd like to do the same thing in Syria um, and then the other group is the media and the intel agencies in the Pentagon they come in and they establish well they set up a uh, generally puppet regimes that they can run in those countries so all of these uh, elements of the oligarchy are profiting off of war and the way they are able to promote their agenda is by creating a doctrinal system that promotes a particular narrative to all of us. Because if all of us knew the real story, we probably would not permit it to happen. We don't want our governments going around and savaging and bombing the hell out of brown men, women, and children in countries all across the Middle East, which is what we've been doing this entire century. So they have to create a propaganda narrative that tricks us and fools us and tells us something different that's more believable, that's more acceptable. Um, so the first thing is, the first idea is that we're living in this doctrinal system and what's acceptable is what supports and furthers the agenda of the corporate oligarchy. So within that system to establish that doctrinal control a propaganda narrative needs to be created. And the, the propaganda narrative and the limits of debate, I think, are established by what I would call a false historical narrative. And the evolutionary biologist Robert Trivers wrote a book called The Folly of Fools, and I would encourage you to take a look at it, where he, uh, he, was, the, he was the evolutionary biologist that kind of discovered the evolutionary foundation of self-deception. And he says that whole societies, he argues uh, very powerfully that whole societies are uh, susceptible to falling, uh, to self-deceiving themselves and falling under the influence of a false historical narrative. And he uses the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as uh, a model by which to explore that. So I think in America we have a false historical narrative and the oligarchy needs to create that to win our support for its imperial wars. What was his name again, please? Robert Trivers. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, it? Folly of Fools. Val, what was it? Val? Hmm? Oh, thank you. Yeah, Robert Trivers. Oh. And it's, it's the false historical narrative, which is uh, the construct that he produced that I think that we are uh, invested in. And I think that's what the oligarchy has created. And what is the false historical narrative? It's largely a narrative, a storyline that inverts reality. So um, the other night I saw 1984, the play, right? Where Orwell said, uh, war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. You see the inversion. You're taking war and telling people it's its exact opposite. Freedom is its exact opposite. and. Even uh, Sigmund Freud, I believe, argued at one point that if you really want to understand what a society's values are, simply invert the moral maxims of that society. So if the commandment says, do not commit adultery, it's because we all want to commit adultery. And I think that formula, it's very similar to Orwell's formula, and I think that's a defining characteristic of a false historical narrative. We invert the reality, the facts on the ground. And I think that's what we're seeing in Syria and what we saw in Iraq. So if, if and, and with this Russiagate narrative, where if the mainstream media is telling you that Russia 
is a hostile, hungry imperial power looking to take over Eastern Europe and then move into Europe and enslave the Europeans to its energy pipelines. And think about that, flip it, and, and America on the other side is always the judicious, noble power that wants to stay out of it but is forced by these children to come in in a paternalistic fashion and intervene for humanitarian or other reasons and separate the kids on the playground. And if you think, use that formula of the false historical narrative and invert that, what you get is the United States is the imperial power looking to push NATO right up to the doorstep of uh, Russia, going back on its promises that it made to Gorbachev after the uh, collapse of the uh, Berlin Wall. And you find that Russia only has, I think, maybe 10 bases outside of its borders? One. One? Is it one? In Syria. In Syria? Yeah, okay. And then we have, I've read, between 600 and 800 bases all around the world. So who's the imperial power here? Um, so that's what I think happens in the establishing of the propaganda narrative. And I think there are three quick points I want to make about what the storytelling elements of that narrative are. The first is find an enemy and demonize that en enemy. And we see that with Assad. We saw it with Gaddafi, um, where they were actually, the mainstream media was telling us stories that Gaddafi was giving Viagra to his troops and telling them to go out and rape people in the countryside. Insane <laughs> fictions that we believed and we bought. And to allow Hillary Clinton and uh, Samantha Power to convince Barack Obama, and Obama got behind it, and they went in and, and through NATO, they backed terrorists, and they basically served as a terrorist air force to get rid of Gaddafi, who had created, for whatever his flaws, he had created the most progressive um, state in North Africa that functioned as the security anchor <laughs> against terrorism in North Africa. And, you know, what about, we always hear, let's, we have to save the uh, Affordable Care Act. We have to save the 12 million people on Medicare that were, Obama put on Medicare. Yeah, great, fine. But what about the 18 million Syrians who lost their free health care? What about the 6 million Libyans who lost their free e health care and education? We don't talk about them. And I think that's one of the disconnects that the propaganda narrative creates in us. We domestically can kind of see what's happening, but when it's something abroad, when we're not on the ground experiencing it personally, it's, we're much more susceptible to a doctrinal narrative that inverts reality. So I think you demonize, you find an enemy and demonize them, and then you romanticize yourself. You, turn, you talk about American exceptionalism and Manifest Destiny and the, and the Monroe Doctrine and all of the, the storylines that have turned America in our minds into this mythical shining city on a hill that mm -hmm. defends the interests of the voiceless around the world and that promotes free market democracy wherever we can. Um, and if we didn't, if we weren't leading the world, there would be a void and it would be filled by the ogreish Russians and the other dictators from um, around, the, around the planet. And the third piece is to, you demonize the enemy, you romanticize your side, and then you eulogize the victims. So we've got this character, uh, the, the Syrian rebels, thousands, tens of thousands of whom were imported from Western China and Iraq and Turkey and Afghanistan and trained and armed and funded and injected like an infection into Syria to attack this Assad regime. And we are told that these people are freedom fighters trying to throw off the shackles um, of this horrible tyrant, uh, evil optometrist I call him, uh, Bashar al-Assad. Not to say that Bashar wasn't part of our rendition program because he was. And I think that we sent people over into Syria and tortured the hell out of them. 
Assad was part of that. He's not. He's not perfect. But when I when I write about this, I don't focus on on him so much. I focus on my country and what my country is doing, and what we can do to stop our own country from committing crimes, wars of aggression, basically, abroad. And the third piece that I wanted to mention, first you have the doctrinal system that we're all ensnared in. Within that, there's a propaganda narrative that inverts reality that we buy into. And when it's about foreign policy, it's much easier to buy into it because we're not in Syria, we're not in Iraq, we're not in Libya. We only get these secondhand reports. So it's incredibly important when you're reading about foreign policy to look for outside sources, outside the mainstream. And that mainstream, of course, is all of the, all of the groups that um, Dr. Miller mentioned. Uh, MSNBC, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, you know, Fox, the ones on the right. Um, corporate, not the corporate. The, not corporate. Well, okay, that's, that's an interesting distinction. I'll have to explore that. Um, the third piece, you've got a doctrinal system within it, you've got a propaganda narrative, and then you need a communication strategy to get that word out. Two things I think are important here. One is credibility, and the second is visibility. And by credibility, I mean you need to use authoritative sources to tell your story. That's, that's the most important thing in getting people to believe. All the news that's fit, fit to print since, I don't know, 1852 or whatever it is, right? For most of us, that's an authoritative source. And, and you know, when we read a, um, a movie review or a theater review, it's well written, it's, cult, it's uh, erudite, it's educated. And so when we read the political articles, we don't even think that maybe now we're shifting into an area where we're being fed propaganda. And I think authoritative, finding the authoritative sources is very important. Who's telling your story is critical. Um, and secondly, with that is uh, the use of influencers, the use of uh, cultural figures who can come in and support your narrative. Uh, the Hollywood community or whoever it is that can come in and back that narrative. And um, then you also want to create, for credibility, the appearance of uh, consensus, right? So the appearance of consensus is uh, tied to the idea of visibility. Consensus is established, the appearance of consensus is established by channel flooding, by flooding all of the media outlets possible with your story. It's not enough just to have it on the New York Times front page on the website. You need it in the print edition as well. You need it on Twitter. I think the New York Times has something like 16 or 17 different uh, Twitter accounts and uh, Facebook accounts for all of their different subcategories. And they get the message out on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube especially. And now you see YouTube defunding alternative voices that talk about uh, you know, precious issues like ISIS. Well, they're going to get defunded. And the advertisers don't want to appear on their platform. So they take, and then you've got, you've got other categories too. You've got broadcast, you've got radio, you've got email, you've got a variety of other uh, channels. The proliferation of digital channels is immense, and that's channel, by flooding those channels with your propaganda narrative, always being consistent and staying on message, that's how you create the appearance of consensus. So there may be an appearance of consensus if you read uh, the Washington Post. I remember before the uh, war in Iraq, the Washington Post editorial board got together and said, uh, created an article and said the article was titled uh, Irrefutable. <laughs> and the opening line was something like, it's hard to imagine how anyone could not believe that Saddam Hussein is harboring weapons of mass destruction. So you read that and you think, well, this is a reputable magazine, reputable source. If, and you read that and you think, well, there's clearly a consensus about this. So you, it's coming from a reputable source. There's consensus. So at that point, and it's everywhere, and you're here, you're getting hit with this same story and claim from all the media sources that you consume. So at that point, the peer pressure kicks in. And you think, well, do I have enough information to defy this narrative? Do you even, are you even questioning at that point? And so what you do at that point, I think, is 
begin to internalize the narrative of power and the storylines of empire. And that's when, that's when we lose. And that's the war um, a professor was talking about uh, the propaganda campaign to get us into World War I. The Creel Commission um, was uh, the leading uh, executor of that um, campaign. And if you look at Robert or George Creel, George Creel's book, How We Advertised America, one of the first things he talks about is the war before the war, winning the media war. And I think what I, I've just tried to describe to you are uh, a few different ways in which uh, the mainstream, the corporate media tries to win that war. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you for that outstanding presentation. And as we are very much in an information war, it's nice to get some perspective on um, how that affects us and our critical thinking. Um, before I bring up our last speaker, uh, Philip Giraldi, uh, Professor Miller left something out of his, his thing that he felt that he should have mentioned, so I'll just let him uh, complete his thought and then we can yeah, get to I, our I last speaker. Yeah, I didn't leave it out. I, I was interrupted. Right? <laughs> was I was sabotaged. I mean, those of you who came in late, you, you've got to watch the video of this. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, it couldn't have been better as far as I I'm concerned. No, no, we had a, we had a very, a very angry philosophy professor uh, from Fordham who just couldn't control himself and started screaming at me about the barrel bombs being used by uh, Assad to slaughter, you know, 10 million of his people. And it was just, uh, it was an, a, a perfect illustration of what you were talking about because this guy had, had probably read fairly widely within, within the frame that, 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 uh, you just described, and th therefore presumes himself to, to be expert on this, mm -hmm. and not just expert, but but morally um, empowered to attack anyone who dares to defend the slaughterous Assad. I mean, it was just it was, and then he buggered off, right? He <laughs> left. Okay, I can't take Did the heat. <laughs> <laughs> or some Ayn Rand, you know, yeah, who, who knows who it is. All right, now. So as I was, you may remember, those of you who are here, what I was saying before I was so rudely and yet <laughs> fruitfully interrupted, I was talking about the description by the New York Times of this um, uh, Buthaina Shaban, an advisor of Assad's, when she paid her Skype visit to the National Press Club in uh, June of 2016. Uh, she'd already been, um, uh, basically pilloried beforehand by a State Department spokesman who said she was a propaganda mouthpiece for Assad. Um, and um, it's important to note how the Times describes her response to the, uh, basically the accusations that were hurled at her disguised as questions. She bristled at questions about act her government or close associates are suspected of committing including the use of barrel bombs to kill civilians, okay? Then I pointed out that Robert Perry had debunked the claim about barrel bombs and that, that set off my colleague here. Um, now, I just wanna continue the analysis of this piece in the Times. It's a perfect illustration of what you just told us about. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna read, this is from a, a, a piece I wrote. It's the introduction to the latest book uh, collection from Project Censored which is an outfit I strongly recommend, but this part I had to cut for space, but now I found uh, a use for it. It's very bit short. Thus the article itself is a barrage of propaganda claims, many of them long ago debunked, as most Times readers wouldn't know. After President Obama came out with that bit about the barrel bombs, uh, Robert Perry shot it down. To the unwitting reader, Dr. Shaban must seem disingenuous, evasive, bristling at some questions and sidestepping others. They use the word sidestepping. And yet her fuller statements merit a far more respectful hearing than she got from our free press that day in Washington because she only spoke the truth, however mocking her description in the Times. This is the way they describe her. Seated at a desk with a Syrian flag behind her. <laughs> Can you imagine? And one pinned to the lapel of her blazer. 
Like our, our people never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Only when they run for office. Yeah. Dr. Shaban defended her government defiantly, assailed the Obama administration as being insufficiently committed to defeating the Islamic State, and blamed Western news media for perpetuating what she called a false narrative about Syria and Mr. Assad's government. Well, I mean, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with what she said? She also criticized our policy as incoherent because we're supposed to be fighting ISIS, but we're also fighting the government that's fighting ISIS, and we're not joining with Russia in its attempt to fight. She, she, she questions this. She points out that this is incoherent. Regardless of whether you think Assad is a monster or not, those claims that she made are completely true. But they come to us ironized by the Times with scare quotes around them, as if it's simply unimaginable that anyone could doubt the wisdom of our policy, you know, however <laughs> fucked up it is. <laughs> now, uh, this is the end. This is kind of poignant because of something she said that speaks directly to what we're saying, and, and yet that was, again, cast as demented by the times. Um, okay, so she said, there's no such thing as moderate opposition in Syria. Dr. Shaban said, denouncing the anti-government groups as a terrorist movement. Although that too appears to be the truth, the Times presents it as just one more sign of Dr. Shaban's cynicism and or self-delusion as a propaganda mouthpiece. Just like that Syrian flag on her lapel, as if US officials don't pin US flags on their lapels. That our reporters can't or won't see any truth aside from what the state defines as true however ludicrous or groundless it may be, suggests that there is something very wrong with what we call the news in the United States today, as Dr. Shaban told the crowd attacking her, and this is what she said, I don't want to give up on the idea of a free press, but you are forcing me to do so, because I'm amazed at how the questions are coming from a completely distorted perspective. Well, I, I know how she feels, you know. Uh, on story after story, what we're getting is the unquestionable truth is patently absurd. And uh, the last thing I'll note is I strongly recommend a recent interview that Stephen Cohen, uh, the eminent historian of modern Russia, did uh, with Slate. This is just a few days ago, with Isaac Chotner, a Slate reporter who happens to be the son of Murray Chotner. People as ancient as I am will remember that he was Richard Nixon's campaign guru in the 50s. His kid Isaac did an interview with Stephen Cohen about Russia, and Cohen knows more about Russia than anybody alive, I think, outside of Russia. And he's trying to set Chotner straight. All this stuff about you know Putin having his enemies murdered, all the stuff that we have long since absorbed as absolute truth because we've been sucking it up since Putin was elected at the beginning of the millennium. All of it is either false or exaggerated, and Cohen, who knows this stuff like the back of his hand, knows the family of Anna Politskaya, knows these people, was a friend of hers, knows the truth or something like the truth about her murder. He's trying to tell this reporter some of this stuff, and the guy's acting like the Times acts in its piece about this woman. This is just, <laughs> what are you, nuts? Are you crazy? The implication is that anyone who departs that far from the official narrative has to be completely psychotic. And I can't think of a better example of how similar that is to the media universe that Shira described in his diary under the Third Reich. Thank you very much, Mark and Jason. In a world where facts and evidence still matter and truth still matters, it's sometimes difficult to tell what the facts and evidence are. So that is the job of the um, investigative journalists who really um, want to determine the truth from propaganda. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce a former CIA officer, uh, Philip Giraldi, uh, who has written some um, excellent recent uh, articles on Syria, and especially around the use of chemical weapons. Um, Philip, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And without further ado, over word. Yeah, I, the, the, the trip was a bit fatiguing. 
coming up, so I'd prefer to speak from here if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> when I was coming up on the train this morning uh, from Washington, um, I was thinking about the issue of war and peace because this is this is not really about Syria. This is about the way the United States and other countries in the world go to war. And I began to think, it, gee, it would be kind of interesting to think how many lies have been told in recent history to support America's wars. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of automatically went back to the Spanish-American War, and then of course there was the First World War, and then there was the Second World War, and then there was Korea. But since Korea, there's been uh, an absolute flood of lies by the government, which in turn have been picked up by the media and replayed without any question, without any criticism. And, and these lies have basically what have been the instrumental part in convincing the U.S. public that we had to go to war. And we're seeing the same nonsense, of course, right now. But um, I was thinking, you go back to the Bay of Pigs. The Bay of Pigs was, a, was supposedly um, a limited military action to support an uprising in Cuba of all those good liberal Democrats that seem to be all over the world and we just can't seem to find them. So that was a lie. Uh, the Kennedy assassination itself has been blamed on Cuba. Uh, now 55 years later, there hasn't been a single piece of evidence to prove that. Um, Gulf of Tonkin, which was mentioned before, it, uh, it um, increased the, the intensity of the war in Vietnam. It was a complete lie. Noriega in Panama. Uh, he was accused of drug dealing and money laundering. Well, he did that, of course, but he was doing it for the CIA. <laughs> and, and when he stopped doing it for the CIA, it proves a, a little bit difficult, he was removed. Uh, Grenada. Grenada was being taken over by the Cubans, but apparently it wasn't and we went in there anyway for the uh, medical students who were apparently being abused but actually they were just confined to their barracks as it were so it was a complete lie as to why we went into Grenada uh, invasion of Afghanistan it was claimed that um, bin Laden that the uh, uh, the Taliban would not turn over bin Laden but that turned out to be a lie they had approached the Swiss Embassy and the Swiss Embassy was quite willing to negotiate the issue the problem was that we didn't have any evidence that bin Laden had been behind 9-11. Um, and we still to this day have never produced evidence that bin Laden was behind 9-11 and to his death he denied it. So where's the truth? Um, Iraq, the, the greatest lie of all time and the greatest foreign policy disaster in the history of the United States. Uh, that was based on the weapons of mass destruction lie which we're all familiar with today. Then we have, oh, hello. Um, <laughs> then, we, then we have um, Libya, Libya based on nothing but lies, that Gaddafi was going to be killing uh, all of the population of Benghazi. It turned out to be a total lie. And, and so Benghazi, for his pains, as it were, uh, was sodomized with, with a, uh, a sword. And uh, we have chaos in Libya, which has fed a lot of the terrorism and chaos going on elsewhere in the world. Um, today. Syria. Syria, as my colleagues have, have so well noted already, uh, tissue of lies. Almost everything being said about the Syrian regime is a lie. Anything you see in the U.S. in the U.S. media in particular is a lie. Uh, and it, Russiagate, another perfect example. This, this has been floating around for over a year. It's completely politically motivated, and virtually everything connected with it is a lie. Uh, and the U.S. government, in spite of this fact, in spite of this fact that it's been uh, promoting this this story, has never produced one one shred of evidence to prove what they're saying. So we have the government lying consistently to support war, and the media coming on board to support that argument. Um, I don't know how many of you speak um, Turkish, but Turkish has an interesting suffix. Uh, it's a mush, which goes at the end of a sentence. And the mush means that you are making a statement, but you can't really confirm that what you're saying is true. So it's an interesting kind of little thing 
it, that that works for Turks. I'm not so sure it works for any other linguistic group. But we have Leish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, I, I get this when I think of the mush uh, suffix. I get this vision of the general staff of the army and military lined up at a table, or the chiefs of intelligence all lined up at a table, telling the same lies about Russia and about Iran. And, and, and about Syria, and I like to see them putting the mush at the end of each <laughs> sentence because they certainly know in their own minds that what they're saying is essentially a lie. Um, I was going to mention some of the issues that my colleagues have already discussed, like the, the lies about the uh, use of sarin gas, so I, I won't go into that again, but just take my word for it, it's a complete lie. The, uh, um, the intelligence agencies even had people who were ready to quit because the uh, White House was putting out uh, reports saying this is the consensus of the intelligence community, but actually it was only the consensus of two or three people who came around and had breakfast at the White House and agreed that, yeah, we should put this out. Uh, th there was never a consensus in the intelligence community on any of these issues, just as there's no consensus in the intelligence community on Russiagate. Um, but I'm just going to, I'll, I'll comment briefly on an article I wrote recently at, that uh, we were, was mentioned before, who is destroying Syria? And I'll give you the punchline before I go into the article. Um, basically everyone is destroying Syria. Uh, Syria is in a situation that is, um, is unimaginable, I think. The, um, the, all, of the Syria, all of Syria's neighbors have agendas that are driving what they are doing. Nobody, uh, with the possible exception of the Russians, um, is in it for anything that is a, a sincere or a generous motivation for the Syrian people. They could care less about the Syrian people. Um, and I wrote this um, uh, after the most recent um, attack uh, with the cruise missiles after the alleged uh, chemical attack uh, in April. And where does it Mm -hmm. Where does it appear? It appears in the American Conservative, which is one of the, one of the places I write for. Uh, anyway, I, I point out in the beginning of the article that the United Nations Charter basically says that the, ob the organization is obligated to determine the existence of any threat to peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression. The Nuremberg trials concluded that to initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is a supreme international crime. The U.S. Constitution's Article I states that only Congress has the authority to declare war, with the understanding per Article II that the President is only empowered to respond if the United States is attacked. With all of this, uh, I go on to say, so how is it that on April 6th, the United States attacked a fellow member state in the United Nations that has an internationally recognized sovereign government? That member state posed no imminent threat, had not attacked the United States, and was not at war with Washington. Nor did that member state consist of or support Al-Qaeda or an associated group, and it was not under any sanction from the United Nations Security Council to authorize any other member state to act against it. On the contrary, that member state was actively fighting several terrorist groups as defined by the U.S. government that had occupied its sovereign territory. So this is, uh, again, getting back to the issue of war and peace. We have the, the United States playing the role of a psychotic aggressor in an international situation which it clearly was wrong, uh, firing those 59 cruise missiles into Syria and there's been a more recent incident where they attacked, uh, U.S. aircraft attacked a uh, column of militia that were affiliated with the Syrian government. So this was, this was not a one-off. And there was even an earlier incident in which the United States attacked Syrian soldiers and killed uh, over 100 of them, I believe. So it's, uh, this has been a pattern of the United States having soldiers in a country with which we are not war without permission of that country's government and we're engaging in military action in support of groups that we have called terrorists. If you can figure this one out, <laughs> please tell me. I mean, I can't. And, and uh, to me, this was the final breaking point with any kind of uh, acceptance of what Mr. Trump represents because 
the one thing that uh, many of my peers in the intelligence community voted for him for was the fact that he was promising us no more wars in the Middle East, no expansion of wars in the Middle East. It turned out to be a lie. So it was another government lie piling on top of the other government lies. All right. Um, the United States basically has been backing regime change in Syria since uh, 2004, according to WikiLeaks. Uh, there were diplomatic uh, communications saying that something had to be done about the Syrian regime. Since 2006, it picked up speed. Um, in, in 2011, obviously with the outbreak of the, of the, the so-called Arab Spring, uh, there were demonstrations uh, against the government, and we used these as a pretext, basically to increase military aid. I was one of the first ones to write um, a story about how planes were flying from Libya full of weapons. They were being flown into Turkey. The, the weapons came from Gaddafi's arsenals, flown into Turkey, and they were being handed out to these uh, so-called rebels, uh, people that nobody really knew who they were or how they were affiliated. But this was what was being done. Um, Okay. Uh, very briefly, I'll go into some of the other complications in Syria. Um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been uh, funding and arming uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda ever since the conflict in Syria began. And yet they're our friends and close allies. So, how did, again, these are, peop these are organizations that are on the terrorism list of the United States government, and we are aiding and abetting them indirectly ourselves and we have alleged allies that are aiding and abetting them directly and yet we no one seems to see the contradiction in this um, the, uh, the Saudis and the uh, Qataris would argue that they're really fighting Iran there so we have another we have we have another enemy state coming into the equation that everybody hates and everybody wants to to bring down so this this again complicates what is going on there and, and the Syrians are basically confronted with a, with a dilemma of a bunch of states lined up against them that really are not lined up against them. They're, against, they're lined up against someone else. So how do you resolve this? Where do you go with it? <laughs> Don't ask me. Um, Turkey is another one. Turkey, um, when I was in Turkey a year and a half ago, ISIS associates were in the streets begging for money. And the Turkish uh, intelligence agency, which I can attest to, is very effective, uh, was doing nothing about it. And they were also supplying weapons and sarin to the insurgents and also to ISIS. And, and this has been documented. And uh, again, Turkey is in NATO. Turkey is one of our allies. Uh, Turkey also attacks the Kurdish militiamen, who are the only effective fighting force that the United States has in Syria against ISIS and against Al-Qaeda. Again, contradiction here? I, yeah, I would say so. Um, okay, finally, Israel. Israel, same kind of story. Uh, Israel has a very cozy relationship with ISIS. Uh, wounded ISIS uh, warriors have been treated in Israeli hospitals. A um, uh, couple months ago, ISIS attacked an Israeli army unit patrolling near the border with Syria. And um, after it was over, ISIS apologized to the Israelis. So, th so much for their uh, pan-Islamic credentials uh, that <laughs> they're in bed with the Israelis. What do the Israelis want? The Israelis want a Syria that's in chaos. This, is, yeah, this has been outlined since the Yenon plan of 1982. The Israelis have laid out in great detail how they would like to deal with their neighbors. And Syria is the one nation that specifically they want to break up into its constituents, Alawites, Christians, um, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, and, and keep them fighting each other all the time because then they don't have any time to, to, to make any trouble for, Syria, for Israel. So we, we have all of these people basically playing a game in Syria and we are aiding and abetting it. You know, we, we insist on, on um, removing the president, regime change yet again. And yet this is a formula that has failed consistently, it has failed every time, and will continue to fail until someone wakes up in the morning and realizes, hey, this just is not what we should be doing. I, I hope that will come soon. Thank you.
before we we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers before, before we get to that. Um, so Philip, given your background in counterterrorism, it must frustrate you that your government is working with essentially uh, on the same side as some of these terrorist groups like Al Qaeda. But getting back to the chemical attack. Was, did that not occur in Al-Qaeda-held, rebel-held territory? And who were the primary sources for that? I'm asking because this was the pretext for the cruise missile attack. Yeah, the, it, inevitably these attacks take place in areas that are occupied by the rebel groups. And they are the sources that then tell the public, that then tell our media, that then tell our government that uh, this was done by the government of Syria. So the information is not credible to start with. And then in the cases of the two uh, gas attacks that we were talking about already, um, there were also technical issues about where this stuff came from, uh, the provenance of, of the sarin that allegedly was part of the attack itself was, was not, was, it was not uh, conducted in a laboratory effective way where you're controlling the sample and, and you're getting an accurate reading as to what it actually is. And, and in fact, even, I think the British, they tested one of the samples recently and they said it was probably sarin. They couldn't even tell. This, this, this sample had been so fooled around with by whoever was involved in this. So I would say uh, my general rule as, as a former intelligence officer is when you're reading these accounts in the media, uh, as you suggested, always look to the source. Now, where is the source of this information? And I find if you keep playing with the, the, what looks like a source, and you keep going back source to source to source, you will find a, finally that it was somebody who was a spokesman for one of the, re one of the rebel or terrorist groups, uh, and this is, then gets filtered through the mainstream media, and once it gets filtered through the mainstream media, it's like it's the truth, and it ain't the truth. All of this stuff ain't the truth. All of the stuff you're hearing about Russia, and all the stuff you're hearing about Syria ain't the truth.